Hello everybody, uh, Mustafa here. I hope that you guys are enjoying a, a wonderful week. I'm recording this video to talk briefly about the Radiohead pricing case, for which we didn't have enough time to discuss it to the length that uh, I originally wanted. So I would like to share my ideas uh, of how I would have approached the case through this video, and hopefully I'll receive your questions, if any, by next session. So let's dive in. Uh, I suggested four questions to uh, discuss uh, this case. Uh, the first question uh, taps on uh, the, four, the question of the 4P. So it asks, uh, does uh, the Radiohead plan to allow the customers to name their own price for the downloaded version of their album a good idea or no, why or why not? And I would like you guys to discuss this in, the, in terms of the 4Ps of the marketing mix. Question number two, can this pricing scheme work for other artists and what the implications for those other artists' economic conditions be? Uh, a best approach to uh, answer this question is to compare established artists like Radiohead, like U2, uh, with upcoming stars who might not uh, enjoy the same social capital as the established artists would. Um, so this is a question of generalizability of uh, the strategy for other artists or other industries. Question number three asks about um, asks if such a release strategy uh, would be effective in in the long run. So Radiohead pulled off this stunt once. Could they do this again and again? And how does it affect the relationship between the artists and the record labels? And uh, the point of this question is for you guys to focus on the fact that when you change and shift one element of the four Ps, the other three elements have to change inevitably in order to fit with the new state of uh, the, the element that you change. And um, this means that with their new str pricing strategy, they're going to have to make changes to their uh, place strategy, promotion strategy, and even product strategy. And I would like the teams to discuss this. Question number four asks, how does Radiohead's plan fit in the wider context of how the internet is affecting the music industry? And this question is there to, for you guys to think in macro levels and uh, tell me how some, of, how some of the changes that were happening in this industry, what, from what we know of this case and of the case of Lady Gaga, uh, how the changes in music industry uh, gave way to these unconventional uh, strategies to take place and triumph over traditional strategies. So let's just jump right in. Um, for the first question, obviously, there is no right or wrong answer uh, that we could give. We could just argue for or against their decision. And uh, some of the pointers that I would have mentioned in my analysis um, would have been uh, the things that I would like to discuss with you in the following two slides. By the way, all these slides are available for you on Canvas. So by 2007, when the case happened, Radiohead was already a hugely successful um, music band. And uh, in order to carry out their strategy, they not only they had to decide on the pricing strategy, but also they had to actually take four distinct steps. Number one was to release the album in two versions, a digital version and a physical version, which was premium priced and deluxe. Step number two was to allow the fans to pay however much they want for uh, the album that they download digitally. Step number three they produced and distributed this album without uh, getting major help from any record label. And number four uh, was uh, they distributed the music not through the retailers of music, but also through their own website. So everybody who wanted to get their hands on this album had to go over to their website to find it. And you should understand that uh, Radiohead was probably the best test case for such an unconventional pricing strategy because their previous six albums, they were all a, a huge success. The uh, sales growth was steady steady and going high and they, were, they had no concern for the profitability of this album. 
Also, for artistic reasons, they did not like the idea of selling individual songs. You should understand that it is 2007. It is in the early years of iTunes and the whole pricing, the new pricing strategy of 99 cents for a single track. And Radiohead, the band, uh, really thought that the album has a personality. And they thought that to be able to cherry pick your best songs and not buy the whole album would not be a really good idea uh, for the fans, for the, for the taste of the music. So, this was a way for them to uh, brand themselves as quote-unquote anti-establishment uh, uh, band who doesn't give in to this new order of, you know, everybody having to uh, uh, comply to the sales of single track songs. And uh, from, so, and the third point I would like to mention is that from an economic standpoint, also it made sense because... You see, they are already a huge group, uh, a huge band with a huge following. So anybody who has not given them a try, now is a good time for them to try this music and see, you know, if they like this music and for the, for the Radiohead to be able to convert them into fans. So um, to actually make available the album for free would uh, bring in a lot of non-fans and convert them into fans. Now, I would like to also talk about how the digital technology was uh, actually shifting the whole music industry. So, by the advent of internet and uh, iTunes, which is a very com comfortable way of, uh, convenient way of uh, buying music, two types of costs were dramatically reduced. Number one, the search cost. Now, the search cost is incurred by the customers. You see, if I wanted to go and buy some music, I had to drive to the nearest music store and then flip through the music label uh, albums uh, in order to find the one that I really liked. And if I was lucky and that was available in that particular place, I would be able to buy it. And then I would come home and uh, listen to it. Whereas now, I do the same process in my pajamas, in my living room, and then uh, all songs are available, and when I download it, it is instantly uh, uh, available for me to play it. So the search cost, the time, the effort, the uh, money that goes into finding your favorite music is dramatically reduced. Another type of uh, cost that was reduced is the transaction cost. And who incurs that kind of cost? You're right, the sellers. Now the sellers, well, uh, with digital music, they do not have to uh, uh, have the cost of packaging, the cost of uh, transportation, you know, uh, uh, the cost of all those costs that are associated with that, they're all gone. You, you just need to create a, a high quality uh, music file and make it available through the digital platforms. Now. At the same time, the whole music industry was taking a hit because the recorded music retail sales decreased by $3 billion, only going from 20, 2006 to 2007. So in a year, the whole music industry took a hit of as big as $3 billion. Why? Because some of that decline was because of the proliferation, pro proliferation of music piracy. It was estimated that for every track sold, there were 20 illegal downloads having taken place. Uh, so uh, another one was uh, with this new, another reason for the decline was the new habit of people to cherry pick the songs and picking only one single track out of an album, which basically uh, decreased the level of sales. Another reason for the decline were the subscription services that, well, now, the subscription services, they allow you to have access to unlimited number of tracks for, um, you know, for a small subscription fee that is uh, incurred monthly. But it is, most of the times, it is not even, uh, you know, as expensive as uh, one album. Um, and, uh, yeah, so these are all the reasons why uh, the music industry was seeing a decline in in digital in uh, retail sales of music so you should understand that the decision of Radiohead comes in such uh, context
he could go with you know uh, putting their music for download for free that is one obvious option they had another obvious option they had was to uh, charge people a fixed price none of them were appealing for radio to radiohead so they chose a strategy in between they said okay we give it away for free but then after the fact you can name your own price and pay us um so if they went with regular release plan i'm looking at the numbers in the slide on the physical album the group the band would make two dollars and 25 cents on average on a physical album every album sold and on the digital album they would make a dollar 40 cents so like half of that whereas with this name your own price release plan we want to know if we make these numbers or not obviously we um, with the digital album everybody can name their own price but the group gets almost a hundred percent of whatever amount that would be and for the deluxe album uh, they would get an unknown share of the eighty dollars which was the price tag for the deluxe album the physical album now uh, I will tell you about uh, what the numbers actually turned out because there was a survey by Comscore and uh, we know about the numbers so I will let you know in, in a bit but before that I would like to talk about how uh, how long term this strategy could be in order to look into that you should understand that Radiohead did not have good relationships with their uh, channel members even prior to this case so they had actually seized operations with their record label as of uh, a couple of years before uh, when the case happened now you should understand that Radiohead um, took a lot of those functions that have to be done by the channel members uh, and they did them in-house so the production distribution and sales of the album now there are a lot of functions that a record label does I've listed a couple of them for you so discovering the artists developing their repertoire uh, advising and guiding those artists um, advancing the artists living and other expenses while they are working on their next album enlisting collaborators uh, bringing about collaborations with other artists funding the recording sessions producing and manufacturing songs and albums distributing the music marketing the music handling the accounting all of these functions either you have to do it in-house or you have to pay a third party or you have a partner for that which is rec record labels so um in the long run it seems like uh, radiohead or any other a music band who wants to uh, follow this pricing strategy they have to update their cost structure to be able to reflect how they're gonna take um, how they want to carry out these functions now uh, let me tell you how the whole project worked out so Comscore did a study and their findings show us that uh, out of every five downloaders two of them paid okay so it is about 38 percent 40 roughly 40 40 percent 40 percent of people two out of five four out of ten people paid and six people did not pay of those who paid on average they paid six dollars which is higher than uh, the, uh, the the money that Radiohead would have got if they had gone with the traditional uh, uh, pricing and channel strategies so you understand that uh, for a physical album they would get 2.25 uh, now uh, they get six of course six is among all the people who paid if you add the people who did not pay or just download it for so over all of the paying and free downloads they got 2.26 dollars 2.26 dollars so as good as selling the physical album regular through regular channels and they just sold them digitally so uh, the the bar for digital um, expenditure uh, the digital profit was a dollar forty cents so they didn't lose money but on the other hand the, the win was not 
really so big that you would say yes it makes sense to let go of the uh, traditional channels that we have and we, let's uh, revolutionize our uh, channeling strategy um, that would be my take on the long-term uh, uh, viability of this strategy but then another thing uh, another point uh, came out of the data that was really interesting it, and that was only 16% of the downloaders accounted for almost 80% of total revenues. Huh. This reminds me of what? The Pareto rule. The 2080 rule. So 16% of the customers accounted for 80% of the total revenues. This tells us probably the fact that Radiohead did this gave them a good way to be able to distinguish two types of fans. The people who pay and the people who are, let's call them freeloaders. Huh? Especially because they did the sales uh, on their website, they have total control over the, over the data. And now, knowing who paid, they can um, target them in their next uh, marketing campaigns or whenever they have an offer, these are the people they want to really go after. The third item that was really interesting from the data was the temporal pattern, the time pattern. So the raw transaction showed that early, download, early downloaders were more likely to pay and the freeloaders kind of arrived later. So hmm, if you wanted to uh, suggest the strategy to another music band, but you wanted to make the strategy a little bit better to take care of this problem of freeloading, what would you do? What would you have done? I'd like to hear about those ideas. Okay. Now, I would like to um, finalize my comments by discussing a question that usually comes up. Is free consumption, sorry, does free consumption lead to cannibalization of sales? So uh, the question is, either we could sell the items for a fixed price or give them away for free or you know name your own price but at the end what type of customers we are training is that going to end up with us not being able to make more money because people are now um, habituated to receiving that product or service for free um, now this is a very good uh, discussion in the music industry, we realize that uh, it is not the case. Well, mainly because there are multiple revenue streams. So, for example, even if you give out the give away the uh, music for free, you can sell concerts, you can sell merchandise, you can have uh, promotional deals. Uh, so, maybe one is actually helping the other streams of revenue to to really uh, flourish. If this is going to be your only source of revenue, sales of products, then you probably want to look into it with more details. Now, uh, a survey was done, and um, I would like to just review these numbers with you. Uh, these are the last two slides of the deck about this case. They asked people, are you a Radiohead fan? And people were put in four different buckets. The first bucket are the diehard fans. I cannot live without them. The second uh, bucket is about, you know, regular fans. Excuse me. So people who said, I like the band, but it's not like I cannot live without them. The third group who are non-fans who said, no, we don't know uh, Radiohead. Uh, sorry, we're not a fan of Radiohead. And the last one are the people who did not know Radiohead at all. And uh, so we have a breakdown of, you know, the proportion of these people. Interestingly, they ask these people, would you download the music, uh, the album, and if you download it, what price you would be prepared to pay? And the numbers are really interesting. They start as of over a little bit over $5 for people who did not know you, uh, Radiohead to above $7 for diehard fans. So you can see that in, in, in an industry where the price of music is kind of set to $0.99, cents, People are prepared to pay more for that. 
And only if we uh, provide the right infrastructure for them and we give them the right reasons. Now, why do you th what do you think about this strategy? Do you think it could be a viable long-term strategy if designed carefully to take care of freeloaders, to take care of the long-term relationship with, with our channels? Maybe we want to restructure our channels for good. I don't know. I would like to hear that from you guys. Thank you very much uh, for watching this video and catch you guys the next time.